All right, if we will, let's all get our Bibles and open to Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> We've started Matthew's account of uh, this miracle this morning, verse number 20. And then we're going to read the other two accounts in uh, Mark and Luke. And uh, talk about our miracle. <clears throat> so start in Matthew chapter 9. I was just looking on here and there's like nobody watching online. Everybody's here. That's a good thing. There are a few people uh, that are watching us online, but we're glad that we've been able to do that and hope we can continue uh, to do that as well. But it's so good to see so many back uh, and with us. Uh, we've, we've missed everybody and uh, it's good to be able to come together to worship. The, um, the miracle that we're going to talk about today, we kind of mentioned it in our last lesson because it takes place right in the middle of another miracle that Jesus was uh, performing or was in the process of, of performing. Remember that uh, a man came to him who had a daughter who was at the point of death, and he asked Jesus to come back to his house with him to heal her. And it was while Jesus was on the way to Jairus' house that this miracle that we're going to talk about today uh, occurred. And so it's kind of an interesting story, the way that it plays out and the way that it happens. And there's some important lessons that we can learn from, not just from the miracle, but from the, the setting and, and the context of the story um, itself. It was kind of a chaotic situation. There was a great crowd surrounding Jesus, and they were following him. They know that he's on the way to perform a wonderful miracle of raising someone from the dead. They don't know it's going to be that uh, yet, but of healing the sick. Uh, and, and a young person, a 12-year-old girl. And so many were going along with him in order to, to see this miracle take place. And while they were all so focused on that action and this you know, big kind of miracle that was happening, another one took place that none of them knew anything about. Jesus did, but none of the crowd understood what was happening. And so we need to think about that as we, as we talk about this miracle. Now, Matthew's account is the shortest account, and it doesn't give us much information, so we're going to read it first, and then we'll go over to Luke, and then back to Mark. So Matthew 9 and verse 20 says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood, twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, when he saw, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. <clears throat> so Matthew's account, as I said, is very brief, uh, short and to the point. He just tells us about this woman and about her sickness, and uh, then, of course, what she did and how she was healed. But the other two accounts uh, go into more detail and give us more information. So I want us to read Luke's account from Luke 8 and verse 43, remembering that Luke is a physician, and so he gives us some more details, and then we'll go back to Mark's account. So Luke 8 and verse 43, the Bible says, And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, <clears throat> and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And the woman saw that she was not hid. When the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. So Luke's account adds uh, some details about the healing uh, from the medical standpoint that the blood was stanched, meaning that it, uh, the blood flow you know, quit. Um, but he also tells us that Jesus asked who had, had touched him when this miracle occurred, and uh, he tells us about Peter's response, and then about the woman coming forward and admitting what she had done uh, and telling why she did what she did. 
So he gives us some more details, but I want us to go to Mark's account. Uh, This is Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse number 25. And we'll focus in on this one uh, for the rest of our uh, time together in our study. Mark chapter 5 and verse 25, beginning. The Bible says, A certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So here we have Mark's account of the miracle. I, it's interesting to me that you know Luke was a physician, and uh, it must have been difficult for him to write that she had visited physicians and they couldn't do anything to help her. Uh, but the truth is the truth, and uh, Luke, as a as a doctor, is admitting that doctors couldn't help this woman, and so he's acknowledging that there was a greater power in healing sickness than physicians, that God is the greater power, um, and that's something that needs to be remembered so oftentimes, uh, even in our world today. But this woman, whose name is not given to us, we don't know who she was or anything about her except the sickness that she had and and this miracle that took place, we find out that she was uh, plagued with an issue of blood. And the idea is is a flowing of blood, hemorrhaging is what the word has to do with. And this was, of course, a a physical problem and, and a physical danger to her, but it also carried with it under the law of Moses, uh, important spiritual considerations. It made her unclean according to the law of Moses. And I'm going to go back to Leviticus 15, and I'm, I'm not going to read this whole passage. It's verses 19 through 27. But I want to read a few verses just for the sake of emphasis to try to help us understand the situation that um, she was in and why she was so desperate for, uh, for healing. So Leviticus 15 and verse 19 says, If a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean unto the even. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And and it goes on. She was unclean, and anyone who came in contact with her or anything that she had touched, they were also unclean. And verse uh, 25 says, If a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, so for longer than the, the seven days she was to be set apart, or if it run beyond the time of her uh, separation, all the days of her issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. So as long as this continued, that's how long she was unclean. Uh, Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. So the old law made it clear that a person in this condition, a woman in this condition as she was, they were unclean ceremonially according to the law of Moses. They were to be separate from everyone because if anyone came in contact with her or anything that you know, she had touched, then they would be unclean until the even they had to you know go through the process of of cleansing so try to imagine not being able you know to touch another person 
for fear of making him or her unclean. We can relate to that in having to be separated from, from one another for so long uh, with this pandemic and all of those things. But she, she literally couldn't touch anyone without them becoming unclean. And she herself was unclean throughout this entire uh, process. So there was the physical side, obviously the suffering that she was enduring, which no doubt she wanted healing for. But there's also this, this other side, the spiritual side, the, uh, the emotional side, the, you know, the, the community, the fellowship uh, part of this uh, sickness that was causing her distress and, and anxiety. This may be why she only wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She may have been afraid if she actually touched him, she would make him unclean. And so she wants to be healed, but she's going to do it in the most humble way possible because of, of her condition. We also understand that this was not a new condition for her, but she had been plagued by it for 12 years. Now, it's interesting to me that the young girl that Jesus was on the way to, to heal, actually to be raised from the dead, was 12 years old. So you have a, a young lady who has been alive for 12 years, and now she's at the point of death. And you have a woman who, for all the time of that young girl's life, she's been plagued with this illness, with this issue of blood. And we, as human beings, have a tendency to, to try to say which one deserves healing you know, more than the other. Should Jesus be more concerned about the, the young girl who is dying and ignore the woman who needs the, the healing from the issue of blood to help the young girl? Or is it okay for him to stop here along the way and to take care of this situation you know, for this woman? Uh, the length of time is, is, is an important detail in the comparison of these two cases. So this wasn't something new to her. She'd been trying to find healing for a long time. And that's why we're told that she you know, went to the doctors uh, to be cured and uh, they hadn't been able to do anything for her. Mark's account concerning that, again, is interesting in the way that he words it. He says that she had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And so, you know, sometimes things don't change. We kind of feel that way sometimes when you go to doctor after doctor after doctor and everyone's trying to diagnose what's wrong with you and you spend all this money and you come back and you don't know anything and you're still just as sick, you know, as you were. Sometimes doctors don't have the answers. Sometimes scientists don't have the answers. Sometimes our highly, uh, you know, educated society that we think we know all the answers, we don't have the answers. And this was one of those cases where no matter which doctor she went to, no matter how much money she spent, they could not do anything for her. But the Lord could. And that's the lesson, one of the lessons ultimately in this miracle, that men were not able to deliver her from this, this sickness, but God was, because God is greater than man. He's more powerful than man, and Jesus demonstrates that by the miracle that he performs. So let's think about the healing. We're told that she approached Jesus, and she did so with faith. She said, if I can just touch his garment, even just the hem of his garment. Mark talks about the border of, of his garment, and we understand that Jewish men wore those, those coats that had borders on them, and um, it's, it's one of the things that the Pharisees particularly uh, focused on to enlarge the borders of their garment because it was a sign to them of religious status and religious standing. Uh, and so they would try to make them uh, bigger and broader and, uh, you know, better than, than the other people around them so people would think more highly of them in a spiritual sense. Uh, that's not what Jesus is doing, he, but that, it was something that the Pharisees uh, did and focused on, but she only wanted to touch, you know, just the hem, just the border of, uh, of his garment, but she believed that if she did that, she would be made whole. So notice how she approached. She approached Jesus from behind. She wasn't trying to be deceptive necessarily, but there was shame that came with her sickness, 
She understood that she needed to be away from everyone because she could make them unclean. And she didn't just approach Jesus, you know, face to face, but no doubt due to the shame and maybe her embarrassment um, and also her humility, uh, she approached him from, uh, from behind. In order to do that, she had to fight her way through this crowd. Um, and it's interesting, again, that the accounts tell us that Jesus was thronged with people, surrounded by people, so much so that when he asked who touched me, uh, the disciples, and particularly Peter with, with his big mouth, he says, are you kidding? You're in the middle of a crowd. There's hundreds of people. Everybody's bumping into you, and you're asking who touched me? He's kind of, you know, saying to Jesus, everybody's touched you. You know, how are we supposed to know? Uh, and that's Peter. You know, he always has that kind of speaking before he, think, he thinks. But Jesus knew that this woman had made her way through this crowd and, and had, had touched his garment. So, again, it demonstrates her faith. She believed that she could be healed if she could only get to Jesus, and she did what she had to do uh, to get there. And then she believed that just by touching his clothes, uh, she would be healed. You know, there, there's nothing that has happened before um, in the story of Jesus' life that would make anyone think that there was power in his clothes, that all you had to do was touch his garment. But she had come to believe that Jesus was, was so powerful that that's all she had to do. And so it, again, demonstrates a kind of humility in approaching Christ. She didn't feel worthy of actually touching him, you know, even uh, of actually speaking to him and asking for anything, but she believed in him strongly enough that if she could only touch his garment, then she would be healed. And so she demonstrates a, a great faith and at the same time a, a, a misinformed faith. She didn't fully understand who Jesus was. She knew that he could heal but she didn't fully understand his compassion and, and what he could truly do for her. And there's an important lesson to learn from that. We'll talk about it in just a minute. So, of course, when she did this and she touched uh, his garment, she was immediately healed. Uh, Luke's account makes that clear, as, as does Mark's, that it was when she touched the garment that she was healed, not after Jesus spoke to her, but at the moment of, of her touching his, his garment. So verse 30 here says that Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? So we need to understand that Jesus knew immediately what had happened. Um, this was not an involuntary miracle. Um, Jesus doesn't do involuntary miracles. It wasn't that you know, he walked around with this power and kind of spilling off of him, and if anybody touched him, they would be healed. Sometimes you see that in the religious world, uh, you know, today. If, if the preacher who has power, you know, if he breathes on you, well, you'll fall down because the power, you know, just comes off of him. Or if you send in so much money, they'll send you a, a handkerchief that has been blessed or, you know, touched by a man who can heal you, and when you touch that, then you'll be healed. The Bible doesn't talk about, you know, that happening with Jesus. What it's telling us is that Jesus knew exactly what was going on. He knew that this woman was approaching him. He knew when she touched him, and he healed her, not his, his magical garment. You know, he didn't have a, a mystical cape that he wore that could heal people. He healed her, and he healed her because of her faith, but he uses this as an opportunity to teach a very important lesson. We need to remember that the Bible teaches us that Jesus knew what was in man. I'm going to turn over to John chapter 2 and notice this verse with you. In verse 24, it says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So Jesus knew all men, and he knew what was in man, because he is God. And it's important for us to remember that as much as we focus on the humanity of Christ, that when he came to, to earth, 
uh, into a, a human body. He was completely human. We don't need to forget that he is still God. He, he's still God, and he still has the uh, abilities of God, and one of those is to know things. Back in John chapter 1 and verse 47, for example, the Bible says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now that's kind of a strange story, a strange exchange of words that takes place there. Nathanael is approaching and Jesus says, here's an Israelite in, in whom there's no guile, no deceit, complete sincerity. And Nathanael says, do you know me? Have we met before? When did we meet one another? How do you know who I am? And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Well, how can seeing someone under a fig tree tell you anything about their character? We don't know what Nathaniel was doing, but the point is that Jesus knew Nathaniel inside and out before he ever spoke a word to him. That's why Nathaniel said, you're the son of God and the king of Israel, because he knew that Jesus didn't know him physically, man to man. They'd never met and never talked. But Jesus already knew him and knew everything about him because he's God. And Nathaniel was quick to understand what Jesus said and what he was doing was demonstrating his deity. Jesus says to him in verse 50, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Jesus says, if that's enough you know, to establish your faith, Wait till you see what I can really do. But that shows us Nathaniel. He really was an Israelite with no guile. He recognized immediately the truth of who Jesus was. So Jesus knew the character of Nathaniel before he ever met him. He knew Peter. He knew John. All these people, he knows them inside and out because he's God. Okay? So when this woman approaches him and, and is healed from this uh, sickness, it wasn't by accident. It wasn't involuntary. Jesus is not, you know, turning around and saying, who touched my clothes? Because he needed the information that something had happened that he wasn't prepared for. He knew exactly what had happened. And he knew who had touched him and he knew what was wrong with her. And he knew everything about her because he's God. We always have to remember that when, when God asks a question, it's always for our benefit and not his, because God is all-knowing. He already knows the answers. So when Jesus asks, who touched my clothes, it's in order to teach a lesson. Not because he needed information, he knew who it was, but because this presented an opportunity to teach, number one, about true faith, and number two, about responsibilities that we have when we are blessed by God. So Jesus asked who touched me, who touched my clothes, to draw the woman out. Not because he wants to embarrass her, not because what she had done was wrong or sinful in any way, but because you cannot hide from God. You can't sneak up on the Lord and secretly receive blessings from him have your sins forgiven, become a Christian, and then sneak back off, back to your home or whatever, and, and never let anybody know, right? When God blesses us, he does so in order for us to make it known to the world so people will know about him. So he calls her out so he can teach this lesson about faith and remind us about the important responsibilities that we have. So you notice in verse 33 of Mark 5, it says, The woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And that's ultimately the point. You can't hide from Jesus. You can't hide from the Lord. If you believe in him and you have faith in him, 
It's not something that you can use for your own advantage and then hide it from him or from the world. She couldn't come to Jesus secretly and receive this healing and then sneak back away and nobody ever know about it. It needed to be made known because it was demonstrating the power of the Son of God. And so he's calling her out not to embarrass her, but so she can make known to the world what the Lord had done for her. So he says to her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And so he emphasizes to her that what had healed her was her faith. She believed, she believed in him, she believed in his power, and she acted on that faith to come to him in humility and in trust. And because of that, she had received the healing. It wasn't faith only. It was faith that trusted and that acted and did something. But it was her faith that had allowed her to be healed of her sickness and disease. And so she can go in peace, and she can be healed and be whole, but, but she can go in peace. And that's kind of the point. This is not something that you've done in secret and you need to keep secret. Um, and, and so you're worried about someone finding out that the Lord has healed you, that you snuck up on Jesus and stole a miracle from him. Jesus says, tell everybody, let it be known, and then go in peace. Not something to worry about, not something to hide, but you can openly acknowledge and confess that you were healed by the Lord. So you can't hide from the Messiah. You can't hide from Jesus. You can't hide from God. He knows us all anyway. He knew her before she touched his garment. He knew her after and, and, and everything anyway. And so you can't keep anything from him, so don't even try. And also, when the Lord is good to us, when he blesses us, when he takes away our sins, it's for our benefit, but it's also for us to then tell the world, to publish abroad who God is and who Jesus is and the power that he has. You can't be a secret Christian. That's just not what Christianity is about. It's about making that message of salvation known. All these other people in the crowd are blessed when they know of this miracle that Jesus performed for this woman. And if she'd kept it to herself, she would have robbed all of them of this blessing of knowing what had happened. And so it needed to be made known, and that's part of the reason why Jesus uh, calls her out. Not that he didn't know, but he wanted everyone else to know what had uh, taken place. Now, in the meantime, while all this is happening, Jairus, people come from his house and tell him that his daughter has died. And, you know, there's no need to bother the master anymore. It's too late. Um, she's dead. And so this delay that has taken place, how, however long it took, maybe those minutes, if Jesus hadn't stopped and, and talked to this woman and drawn her out of the crowd and done all of this, maybe he could have made it to that house on time, you know, to heal Jairus' daughter. That's kind of what Jairus seems to be thinking. We're on our way to, to perform this great miracle for, for my daughter, and we have to stop because, you know, some woman sneaks up behind Jesus and, and touches his garment. But everything that the Lord does, you know, he does with a purpose, and he does according to his plan, his purpose, and his timing. It didn't matter if he got to that house on time or not. Uh, because there was no on time. It was the Lord's time. See, it didn't matter if she was sick or if she died. He could heal her anyway. He could bring her back from the dead. In fact, if Jairus had had the kind of faith of the centurion, Jesus could have spoken the word from where he was, and she could have been healed however far away she was from him. But Jairus' faith was that Jesus needed to come to his house to heal her. And so what looks like a delay here what men often view as a distraction, many times it's something that God sees as an opportunity. So this distraction from Jesus' mission of healing this young girl was actually not a distraction at all. It's an important event that takes place. And it was worth the time for Jesus to stop the crowd and to draw this woman out and to make known the miracle that had taken place, the faith that brought it about, and now her responsibility 
to, to make that known to others because God's blessing is, is for everyone. And so what Jesus did was necessary, even though it looks like it kept him from, you know, saving Jairus' daughter before she died. It didn't keep him from anything. The Lord is in control, and, and he's in charge, and it's showing us again why we should trust in him. So we learned some important lessons from this miracle. It demonstrates Jesus' power, of course, over disease, and in this case, over what we would call incurable disease, a disease that man didn't know how to cure, that doctors couldn't you know, get rid of. Jesus could. He could take away that incurable disease. And that reminds us, of course, of his great power, his authority, and demonstrates his deity. It also teaches us an important lesson about sin. Sin is our incurable disease. There's no way for man to take away his own sins. No man is able to do it for us. No one is able to you know, offer a great enough sacrifice to take away our sins, to do enough good works to take away our sins. It's incurable from man's perspective. We cannot remove our own sins. But God can. Jesus can. And by the shedding of his blood, he offered himself as the sacrifice to pay the price for our sins, to give us a cure for this incurable disease. And he could do that because he is Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is deity and he is humanity all together in one. It also reminds us that Jesus knows what's in our hearts. He knew this woman and he knew what was in her heart. And, of course, he had compassion toward her, but he knew what she was doing and even what she was thinking, you know, as, as this whole thing was taking place. He may not have led on to anyone else, but he knew what was happening. And when the time was, when time was right, he made it known. Jesus, of course, knows our hearts as well. He knows what we're thinking. He only, not only sees what we do, and here's what we say, but he knows what, what's in our innermost thoughts. And he's aware of those things. There's nothing that we can keep hidden from him. And sometimes we think that's a bad thing. You know, there are things we wish that maybe we hadn't said or done, and we wish the Lord didn't know about it, or things that we thought that no one else may know we were thinking that, but we wish God didn't know. But he does know, and it's not a bad thing that he knows it's a good thing. Because it teaches us and reminds us that there's nothing hidden from him, so why try to hide anything from him? We need to just be honest with him and be honest with ourselves when it comes to our sins. If we've done wrong, just admit it. He already knows it. He's already provided the way to forgive us. He just needs us to acknowledge it and you know, to take ownership of it and to admit our wrong and then repent of it and ask him for forgiveness. And that's the promise that uh, the Lord gives us, that he'll take away our sins when we do that. And so faith is understanding that God knows us inside and out, and there's nothing that is hidden from him. So we're going to trust whatever he says, and we're going to do whatever he says, and know that we'll receive the blessings that he has promised us. And I want to mention one last thing in connection with this miracle. It's important for us to understand that this woman was healed and could only have been healed by that which was connected to Jesus. One garment was not as good as another. She couldn't have just gone into the crowd and touched someone else's garment and been healed. It had to be the one that belonged to Jesus, right? We understand that because he's the one who has the power to heal. So you couldn't just pick any garment that you wanted. It had to be Jesus' garment. When it comes to spiritual healing, one plan of salvation is not as good as another. The only one that can save us is the one that's connected to Jesus. And that means doing what he says to be saved. And what he says, of course, is that we have to hear him. We have to believe in him. We have to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3. We have to confess him. Matthew 10, 32, and 33, and we have to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Mark 16, 16, Jesus commands those things. And so a plan of salvation that man has come up with that 
maybe sounds good to us or maybe it is what we wish you had to do to be saved, it cannot save unless it is connected to Jesus. The same is true of the church. When we're forgiven of our sins, the Lord adds us to his church. Any old church won't do. You can't just look at all the different churches and say, well, I'm going to pick this one or I'm going to pick that one. It has to be the church that belongs to Christ. That's the only place where salvation is found. Just like she couldn't just pick any garment, one wasn't as good as another, only the one that was connected to Jesus. And the church that belongs to Jesus is the one that submits to his will, that worships according to his instructions, that teaches his doctrine, that does the work that he has commanded and authorized us to do, is organized the way that he has commanded, that wears his name, that follows his gospel. That's the church. And there's only one church. There are many congregations, but there's only one body of Christ. And I want to be in the body that is connected to Jesus, not a body that some man has created and instituted that follows the, the laws and the rules and the writings of men, but the one that belongs to Christ. And the only way to become a part of that church, a part of that body, is by doing what we just talked about, obeying his plan of salvation. That's what they did in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. They believed what Peter preached. He commanded them to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And as many as received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When they obeyed the Lord's gospel, their sins were forgiven, and he added them to his body, the church. And that's how simple God's plan of salvation is, and it keeps us connected to Christ. And so that's his instructions, and it's an important lesson that we learn from this miracle, that if we want the spiritual cleansing, healing that Jesus promises, we have to obey his doctrine, be a part of his body, the things connected to him, and not do what we want or we think or what man says. And so I hope that we'll think about that also. The Lord already knows us. He knows if we're his children or not. He knows if we're saved or if we're lost. He knows the sins that we've committed already. What he wants is for us to admit our wrongs, admit our need of him, and come to him on his terms and receive his blessing of forgiveness. And then when he's blessed us, to go forth and tell it to the whole world. Not to hold it to ourselves and keep it a secret, but to make it known so everyone can know about the salvation that's found in Christ and through the power of his blood. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you've heard what you need to do to become one, we encourage you to think seriously about it. And if you're ready to put on Christ in baptism, we can help you do that this very hour. If you've done that but haven't been faithful to him and you need to come back home, just as we've talked about, repent of your sins as you acknowledge them, confess them to him, and ask for forgiveness through prayer. We can pray with you and for you, and of course God will do what he says. He'll forgive us, he'll restore us to salvation, and we can all work and labor together in his son's body for that eternal home in heaven. I hope we'll think seriously about it, and if there's some sin that you need to make right today, you'll make that decision, and if we can help in any way, let it be known by coming forward, even now, as we stand and as we sing.